All right. So uh, we've been talking chapter four and last time we talked about some experiments um, that led to our better understanding of the atom. Remember that a lot of the earlier work was done with like the CRT uh, to sort of explore electrons. Uh, there was Thompson. Uh, There's also Milligan who did an oil drop experiment. Uh, from that, we were able to determine really the uh, mass of an electron. Uh, that brought about sort of the early sort of model of the atom, which is the plum pudding. And remember, that was sort of the model where uh, the positive charge was really spread out all over the atom. Uh, we had these electrons sort of embedded inside. Most of the mass of the atom was thought to be the electrons. And again, this was sort of the uh, accepted model of the atom until really the next major sort of development came about, which was our gold foil experiment. And the gold foil experiment, which was done by Rutherford, uh, basically explored the nature of atoms uh, by shooting alpha particles at it. And as we talked about, they were kind of surprised based on what they uh, sort of saw as a result of their experiments. Uh, they did assume that most of them would kind of go through with some deflection as they're positively charged particles going through like positively charged pudding there, I guess. Um, but what they actually saw was that a lot of them didn't have any trouble sort of sailed through with no problem. Uh, those alpha particles, they did witness though every so often that particles were scattered at really large angles. Uh, and again, what that meant was uh, we sort of had to abandon this idea of the atom uh, and go with the idea that really all that positive charge is sort of centralized in what they call the nucleus, uh, which later were found to have the protons, which are positively charged. And neutrons in 1930s uh, were found to be in there as well that have no charge. Uh, they found that most of the atom was this empty space. And in that empty space is pretty much where our electrons are really traveling about uh, the nucleus. And again, a major difference between the two models as well is that most of the mass of the atom is actually the nucleus as both the proton and the nu neutrons are about 1800 times heavier. And Uh, because of the protons that are present, uh, there are other particles like neutrons, but they have no charge in there and stuff like that. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to talk about it right now in just a sec. But uh, um, so that was uh, the major sort of uh, version of uh, pretty much the atom and the modern version as we, we talk about here. And in a later chapter, um, the electrons aren't really pretty circles or anything like that. They do travel pretty randomly about the nucleus. Uh, there is some attraction between the electrons, which are negatively charged, and the nucleus, which is overall to be charged. Um, and they will come together and kind of hold the electrons there. And as we talked about, that's why certain electrons are involved in bonding. Uh, other ones are not really involved in bonding. Uh, we then started talking about a couple important uh, parts of the atom, in a sense, uh, which is the atomic number, uh, which is sometimes abbreviated with a Z. And that is the uh, number of protons there are in an atom. And that number is uh, the number that you can find on the periodic table, uh, which is the top number. As we talked about, every element has its own unique atomic number. Uh, which means every element has a different number of protons. And that obviously is the most important out of all those particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons in terms of determining what element you're dealing with. So it's really the number of protons that determine sort of what element uh, you are dealing with. Remember that uh, if it is a neutral atom, uh, the number of protons, which are positive, uh, would then have the same number of negatively charged electrons. So that's charge equals zero. Uh, but again, the definition of atomic number is just the number of protons. So it has nothing to do with electrons. Uh, it's just the number of protons. The mass number, on the other hand, uh, is the uh, number of protons and the number of neutrons that there are in an atom. Yes, sir.
So uh, I think maybe you're talking about like something like uh, Copper 64 or something like that. Yeah. Why well, didn't know? That's just the way sometimes isotopes are written. Uh, sometimes it's very common. Isotopes or, or radioactive isotopes are sort of written. Um, but the uh, mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. We know that's not the atomic number. Uh, because again, if you go to the periodic table and look under copper, uh, it's 29. That's the number that you see above it. And that would be the number of protons that are present. Uh, the importance of these two things is if you take the uh, mass number and you subtract it from the atomic number, uh, that will get you your number of neutrons. So that is the way that you can calculate the number of neutrons. When you calculate all those things, uh, as we talked about, uh, the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons, and the mass number and atomic number, they all do need to be uh, positive whole numbers. So they ought to always be whole numbers, which means you will have enough information to calculate those things. Uh, the way that we write this class, uh, which is like this, where we use the symbol and we put the mass number, bless you, top left, and the atomic number, Top number minus bottom number will give you and the number of neutrons. The mass number is not found on the periodic table. Um, so once again, the number that's on the bottom here is the atomic mass, which is different. Uh, and we'll talk about it in a later chapter, I think, or down the road. Uh, but the atomic mass is uh, based on the number of uh, sort of protons, electrons, and neutrons there are, and really all the naturally occurring isotopes that are present. So remember that an isotope is the same element, but they have different numbers of neutrons, right? So we wrote some of the things for hydrogen, I think we did. Uh, and what you see down there is the mass that's based off of a standard isotope of carbon, and all the naturally occurring isotopes that occur for a particular element. And that's why they're mostly decimal sort of numbers. So that's really the easy way to remember that you should not use that for the mass number is it does need to be a whole number. And as I said last time, it's not just because there's people around that number or anything like that. So that's really not where it's based off of, but that is where a lot of confusion about mass number and stuff like that. So maybe formula that we'll learn about as to how we come up with those sort of numbers that you see on a periodic table. <clears throat> Other questions? All right. So I think we laid up uh, before the example, I think. Um, so let me go back to apparently the examples. <laughs> Too far forward. There we go. All right, so I don't think we did this one right. So why don't we do this one here? So for each of these, uh, determine how many protons, electrons, and neutrons there are for each of these guys. So take a few moments there and determine that. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so once again, uh, when we look at this one, CO, which is cobalt, uh, top number here is going to be our mass number. Uh, bottom number here going to be our atomic number. And one thing that we know, or just in case you don't know, is it is neutral because there's nothing written there. So again, if it did have a charge, uh, that's where you would see it. Uh, so that means we could really start with our atomic number here, which will tell us the number of protons, uh, which should be 27. And once again, because it is neutral, that means it does have to have an equal number of negatively charged particles, uh, which are our electrons. And again, 27 positives and 27 negatives pretty much give you no charge overall. Uh, for our number of neutrons, once again, we're going to take our mass number, which is our top number. We're going to subtract it from our atomic number, which is our bottom number there. And looks like maybe a 33, I think. In that. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Coming down here to CL, which is chlorine. Uh, once again, starting with our atomic number, which is 17. That will tell us, again, our number of protons. We see nothing written there, which, again, tells us that it is neutral. 
Uh, so we should again have a matching number of electrons to give us no charge. And again, for our neutrons, we're gonna take our mass number minus our atomic number, and we will end up with 20 in this case. And lastly here, uranium. Uh, starting over here, uh, atomic number, uh, which is 92. Again, it is neutral, so we will have an equal number here of negatively charged electrons, and our number of neutrons is going to be 238 minus 92. Feels like a lot, a buck 46 maybe or something like that, I think. And that is how many uh, neutrons we should have. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> okay. All right, so let's take a look at a few more here. Uh, so for these, why don't you write the correct symbols that have the uh, mass number and atomic number in it? And for the last one, I think you're also going to figure out protons, neutrons, and electrons. Take a few moments and write the proper symbols. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, we'll start with uh, krypton, which is uh, KR. So helpful in this, obviously, is a periodic table. So if you went to the periodic table and you found krypton, I believe you will see 36 written above it. And 36 above it would be its atomic number, which means that is what should go down here. That number is also important because that will be our number of protons will be 36. And since we're looking for our mass number, which is our number of protons plus our number of neutrons, uh, that would mean we have 36 plus the 48 that was given to us there. And we would go 36 plus 48, and we will end up uh, with 84 there. And that would be our mass number in this case. So once again, that is how we get the mass number. We don't take the number that is underneath there on the periodic table, which is on that one there. Next one is nitrogen. So once again, go into the periodic table and finding nitrogen's box, and we will see lucky number seven there written above it. Uh, so that would mean that is its atomic number, which would go down there on the left. That again is going to give us our seven protons uh, plus our six neutrons that are there, and that will give us 13 for our mass number when we add them together, and that will go up there up on top. Lastly, here we're going to look at iron. Uh, so iron actually is Fe on the periodic table. Up there. Six above it. And that means, again, here, uh, 26. They actually gave us the mass number here of 56. So that would be our proper symbol written here. Our number of protons in this case would match our atomic number, uh, which would be 26. It didn't mention anything about a charge here, so we could safely assume that it's going to be a neutral charge here. Uh, so we'll have a matching number of electrons. And in this case, we'll actually take our number of neutrons, our mass number, which is 56, minus our atomic number, which is 26, and it looks like 30 in that case there. It's on any of those there. <clears throat> Uh, on this, this question, the perfect number may not be given to you, uh, but if you're given the element, that's pretty much like giving you the atomic number because all you have to do is go to the periodic table and find that element and you'll have the atomic number basically from it. And like I said before, uh, questions like this will obviously give you information that you can calculate again the amount of neutrons and the protons without incorrectly using that's on the periodic table. Any questions on that? <clears throat> so what happens if something uh, did have a charge or something like that? So uh, if things do have charges, so let's say if uh, something did have a charge, things that do have charges are what are referred to, as we'll see a little later on in this chapter, so kind of preview it a little bit earlier here. Uh, those are ions. So these are things with charges. And there's really uh, two types of ions that we come across. Uh, there are cations, uh, which are positively charged. And there are anions, uh, which are negatively charged. So, for example, uh, let's say that we had, we'll just use these two that are up here on the page here as an example. So, let's say we had nitrogen here. 
uh, with a minus three charge, and we have the same sort of mass number, atomic number. Uh, so earlier here, the neutral uh, nitrogen has uh, seven protons. It has seven electrons, which gives it no charge. And obviously it has the six neutrons that we had before. So when we look at this with a minus three charge, it has, in terms of protons, it still has seven protons, right? Uh, it also still has, if we subtract those numbers, the six neutrons in this case. So what it has, though, is a different number of electrons. And how many electrons would it have in this case? It would have 10 electrons in this case, 10 negatives, right? And seven positives leaves you a minus three left over. And it basically has three more electrons than it started with in its neutral uh, state. So that's an anion. And what we look at from its neutral spot to its guy with a charge is it actually gained more electrons. And that's how you become an anion is through gaining electrons. So when you see a negative charge on something, the negative tells you uh, that it has gained electrons. And the actual number tells you how many electrons it gained from the neutral atom. So minus three means it has three more electrons than the neutral one. So easy way to figure out what the charge should be if you're not sure is, you know, in the neutral atom, it should have the same number of electrons as the protons. So in this case, you could just add three to the atomic number, and that'll tell you how many electrons you would have uh, because you should have three more. Uh, now, if we look at iron, uh, we'll take a look at this iron here. And obviously, we just did it, but uh, it had uh, protons uh, 26, electrons 26 in our neutral guy, again, giving us really no charge. And we had our 30 neutrons in this case. So if we have this here and it had a plus two charge, uh, once again, here it would have our 26 protons because that's the atomic number. If we take the difference there again, we would have our 30 neutrons just like previously. In this case, though, the number of electrons would be, electrons here would be 24 electrons, right? Uh, so 26 positives, right, and 24 negatives means that it has a plus two charge basically left over. Uh, in this case, when we compare from where it started to where it ended, it actually has two less electrons, and that is what a cation is. So when you see a positive charge, it means that it has lost electrons, and the number of the charge is how many electrons it has lost from its neutral uh, sort of state. So that's basically how we have that. In most cases, as we'll talk about, it is metals that typically will lose electrons and become cations, uh, which is basically to the left of the periodic table. And it is nonmetals, uh, which is upper right of the periodic table, are typically the ones that will gain electrons. As we'll talk about, that's basically what a ionic compound is. It will uh, basically have the metal lose its electrons. Non-metal will basically accept them. So why is it only the electrons that change? Something gets a charge and not the protons. Yeah. Yeah, so if we do change the protons, it would no longer be nitrogen, right? So we can never change the protons. So when something does gain or lose electrons, uh, that's the only thing that will happen as they gain charges because again if they lose or gain protons then you're the electrons and obviously the neutrons here are neutral so it has obviously no any questions on that yeah yeah what uh, that's so that's how you uh, calculate the number of neutrons because the 56 is the mass number and the 26 is the atomic number. So if you subtract those two, that will give you the number of neutrons there are. So it nothing changed in this particular example from the first one to the other one uh, with the charge. So the number of neutrons stays the same. Yeah. And it, it probably will in most cases, unless you're talking about a different isotope or something like that. Uh, but uh, again, because they're neutral, they'll have no effect on the charge.
other questions. <clears throat> All right, so I want you to try. Uh, let's do. Um, let's do. Let's do this guy with. Uh, And let's do. Okay, let's take a look at the one left here. So uh, we're going to start here with our protons, uh, which will be equal to the atomic number, which is on the bottom there. Um, we see we have a negative charge, which means it has gained electrons, and it's negative one, uh, which means in terms of its electrons, it actually gained one electron, which means it should have 36 electrons here. And that will give us 35 positives and 36 negatives, leaves us a minus one left over, which once again is basically where that charge comes from. In terms of our neutrons here, we're gonna take our mass number, uh, which is the top number, which is 80, uh, minus our bottom number, which is 35. And that looks like a 45 in terms of our neutrons. Any questions on that one? Coming to the guy on the right, uh, we're gonna start here with our atomic number. Uh, so that's going to be our protons, which is 13. Here we see a positive charge, which means it has uh, lost electrons, and it has lost uh, three electrons in that case, uh, which means that it should end up here with three less electrons, which would be 10, and that will be plus three charge over here. And in terms of our neutrons, it will be our mass number, 29, minus our atomic number, which is 13, and that will be 16. I feel like I said lost electrons on that one, where it should have said gained electrons, but obviously it's negative. It should be gained electrons. <clears throat> Any questions on mass number, atomic number, protons, electrons, neutrons, neutral things, things with charges? Need to be able to obviously do all that. Yeah. Any questions? <clears throat> Now let's talk a little bit about the periodic table here. Um, but uh, one last thing about isotopes is again, uh, most chemical reactions as we've talked about previously really do involve bonds being made and broken and that's really all electrons. So um, the chemistry of isotopes are very similar to each other. That's why people will sometimes use radioactive versions of elements. Uh, in experiments. So for example, if you're interested in what's happening, say with copper or something like that, uh, you can use the version of your experiment and you can follow where copper went throughout the entire sort of uh, because copper in a sort of radioactive form, isotope form and regular non-radioactive form uh, basically will behave the same because it's still copper and stuff like that. So has a lot of advantages sometimes uh, those sort of properties of isotopes. All right, so let's talk about the periodic table. Periodic table's hanging on the wall. Actually, two periodic tables in this place. Uh, so periodic table obviously gives a, a good amount of information about the elements, some of which we've touched upon uh, in previous days and today as well. Uh, so let's take a look at each of these sort of important parts of it. When you go down a column on the periodic table, uh, so that's up and down. Uh, that is referred to as a group. Or if you're really old like me, it's a family, but nobody calls them families anymore. Everybody calls them groups. Uh, and when we look at periodic tables, that has no numbering. That one has numberings on it. We'll see some different types of numbering of the groups. And what we use in pretty much all chemistry classes, including this one and all the ones that you'll probably take as well, is what is sometimes referred to as the representative numbering. And sometimes you'll see it numbered as like A and B type numbering. And it's really the A numbering that we use. So with the A numbering, group number one is here. And most people just call it group one, but sometimes it's really officially group 1A. Uh, group two, we actually skip here. We come over here, group three, group four, group five, group six, group seven, and group eight over here. By the way, group one actually starts with lithium and not hydrogen. We'll talk why that is in just a second. But although on most periodic tables, hydrogen is hanging out right there, uh, it's actually not part of group one. So uh, it actually does start with lithium group one. 
Um, bless you. Sometimes you'll see B numbering through here, and sometimes be yeah, the kind of number like eighteen all the way across and stuff like that. But we give you A numbering, which is one, two, skip the middle, five, seven, and eight. A uh, period is going from left to right on the periodic table. So periods head uh, this way. And that is one first period, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seven. So periods head this way on the periodic table. Uh, as we've been talking. Protons that we have. And as we can see, it does also increase as you start left there and go across and kind of zigzag back and forth. Uh, it does increase as you kind of go to the right on the periodic table. And as we talked about previously, again, all elements have their own unique uh, atomic number. Now, uh, the periodic table is basically broken up into three sort of categories of elements. Uh, there are metals, uh, there are non-metals, and there are metalloids, which are also sometimes referred to as semi-metals. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. They're also malleable. Uh, they can be hammered into sheets, thin sheets, uh, pulled into wires. They typically have a shiny appearance. Uh, metals, for the most part, are solid at room temperature. Uh, the one exception is mercury, which is why on a lot of periodic tables, it is a different color. Like on that one, it is blue. This one has got a green box on it over here. Uh, so uh, mercury is a liquid. All other ones that are metals are typically solids. On most cases, you could find like was sometimes referred to as like a staircase kind of coming down here, right around boron. And it kind of comes down through here. Our case are nonmetals and nonmetals pretty much have the opposite sort of characteristics of metals. They are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Uh, they have a more varied sort of state. Uh, some nonmetals are gases. Uh, some are liquids or solids. A lot of the nonmetals, if you uh, will remember, are our diatomic molecules. Uh, which are elements to how they come, like our hydrogen, right? Our nitrogen, our oxygen, our fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So these, as we talked about, are elements, right? They're also diatomic molecules. This also brings us to the reason I said earlier, this guy over here is hydrogen, yes? Hydrogen is a metal or a non-metal. Hydrogen is a non-metal, even though on most periodic tables, it's hanging out right above all the metals. Yeah, So that is why hydrogen is not part of group one, because it is technically a non-metal. Hydrogen is over there for certain reasons, because it has some unusual properties, which in a lot of cases, we sort of treat it like a metal and sort of how it bonds and we name it and stuff like that. Uh, but it is actually a non-metal. So again, group one, uh, which is right here, does begin with lithium, which is a metal. Um, when we come to the staircase, as you can see, and some books will include boron with it, uh, these sort of staircase coming down here, uh, those are our metalloids, are sometimes referred to as semi-metals. And these are um, elements that basically have properties that kind of fall on both sides of where they're located. So the same element will have some properties that are very similar to uh, metals, and that same element will have some properties that are very similar to non-metals. So kind of makes sense about where they're sort of located in that kind of transition point between kind of metals to non-metals. Uh, they kind of bridge the gap between them, like semiconductors and stuff like that. They have, you know, the ability to kind of have properties that fall on both sides of it. Um, some other important parts of the periodic table. There are certain groups with special names. Uh, so starting here at group one, which once again begins with lithium, these are the alkali metals. Um, and that's lithium, sodium, uh, potassium, and all those guys coming down. Right next door at group number two are beryllium, magnesium, calcium, all those guys. Those are the alkaline earth metals. 
the word alkaline pretty much means basic. And a lot of strong bases, as we'll talk about towards the end of the, uh, the semester, a lot of strong bases actually come from group one and group two on the periodic table uh, that hook up with hydroxide, things like sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide. Uh, so a lot of those kind of bases are coming from uh, these guys in group one as well, our group one and two. All the way over here, group seven, our diatomic guys over here are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and so forth. Uh, these are the halogens. Uh, and again, as we talked about, pretty much they all come as uh, twos as you come across there. Group number eight, the halogens. Uh, the halogens are a lot of those diatomic uh, sort of elements. Uh, they're very reactive. They react with metals to form ionic compounds. So a lot of metals that hook up with the halogens will give us things like sodium chloride, sodium bromide, right? Potassium chloride, potassium iodide, uh, potassium fluoride. But they acids like HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, HF, which is fluoric acid, HBr, which is hydrobromic acid. Uh, and again, in their natural state, as we've talked about, they come as these twos, right? Diatomics. Uh, so for us, chlorine is a pale green gas. Bromine is kind of like a brown liquid with a little vapor over it. And iodine is like purple. And we'll see some iodine, I think, in one of the experiments coming up. Maybe next week. Uh, right next door, as I was mentioning, are what are referred to as the noble gases, and that's group eight. They're also sometimes referred to as rare gases, very rarely now. Most people would call it noble gases. Uh, that's your helium, your neon, your argon, your krypton, all your ons, your xenon uh, are over there. Now, the two rows on the bottom of the periodic table, these are our lanthanides and actinides series. And they're usually set there on the bottom so that it is not too wide, your periodic table. Uh, but if you follow the numbering of the atomic number, that is 57, and then it skips to 72. Uh, that is 58 right there. If you follow here, that is 89, and then 104, that is 90. Technically, these two rows go right about there is where they actually should go in. The only periodic table I ever stick this one where they actually have them in that sort of right location. Yeah. So if you stick them in there, periodic table gets really, really large. Uh, so most periodic tables look like this one on the screen and obviously the one over there on that wall. Uh, but that's technically where they go, as you can kind of see uh, you know, on that particular ta table there. They're called the lanthanide and actinide series because those are the elements that they should follow on the periodic table uh, in there. Between group number two, which is here, and group number three, which is here, this part that we kind of skipped in terms of our numbering, uh, these are our transition metals. One thing about transition metals are, as we will talk about when we talk about naming, is uh, they have the ability, most of them, to form variable type of charges. So, uh, for example, iron can form plus two or plus three cases. Or could you plus two, plus one in certain cases. So unlike some of the other metals to the left there, which have more fixed charges, uh, these guys have usually more of a varied type of charge. Questions on that there. So the characteristic shape of the periodic table was originally devised. Uh, things in uh the same sort of group are kind of the same period, do share similar sort of properties as you go there. Obviously, as we go from sort of uh, left to right here and up, uh, we're going from more metal to non-metal as we kind of curve upwards and going across there. Um, any questions on that? A couple more things on this. Noble, by the way, uh, like noble gases, uh, represents a group set apart. Uh, noble gases are sometimes referred to as being chemically inert, which means they don't react with other things. Uh, they will react with themselves. There's also some noble metals like gold, silver, and platinum. They're kind of unreactive as well. Um, and those are those guys right here in this range there on the periodic table. 
Um, and again, our noble gases, which are over here. Now, noble gases are what are referred to as being monoatomic. Uh, uh, they do come as ones, basically. Uh, they're usually all colorless gases at room temperature. They're chemically inert. Um, and again, our noble metals there, silver, gold, and platinum. They are the least reactive of all the metals. Any questions on periodic table? So you need to know periodic table, uh, which way groups go, which way periods go, uh, the group numbering, the one, two, skip the middle, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, you need to know specifically where you find the alkali metals, uh, where you find the alkaline earth metals, the halogens, uh, the noble gases. You need to know where you find the transition metals. And obviously, you need to know characteristics of metals, non-metals, and semi-metals are metalloids. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, a lot of those non-metals are diatomic molecules, uh, which are really molecules that are made up of only two atoms. Uh, by the way, a diatomic molecule doesn't necessarily always have to be the same atom. Uh, but we use it for these sort of examples. If you have something like carbon monoxide, CO, that is also diatomic. It just has two atoms, uh, one carbon and one oxygen as well. All right, so obviously uh, we do a decomposition of water, which you'll do in an experiment. You'll run an electrical current over water and you'll produce hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Uh, and we'll get our diatomic uh, elements here. As we've obviously touched upon, I think, in an earlier chapter as well, usually the elements that make up the compounds have very, very different properties, right, than the compounds that they make up. And that's obviously the case with water. It has very different properties, again, than hydrogen gas or oxygen gas. And here's just a table from your book of some of those diatomic guys and what they look like. Now, the structure of solid non-metallic elements... Um, are a little bit more varied uh, than metals. Uh, and when you have sort of different forms of the same element as a non-metal, uh, that is what is sometimes referred to as an allotrope. And an allotrope is really kind of like the same element, but because of its different arrangement, uh, has some different properties. An example of that is carbon. Uh, carbon could come as a diamond uh, and carbon could come as graphite and Carbon can also come as what is referred to as fullerens, which are really large amounts of carbon, 60 or more. They kind of are envisioned to look like a soccer ball sort of shape um, is what a fullerin looks like. But they are all made up basically of carbon. You do get a different response, I imagine, if you gave a graphite versus a diamond. Probably today, especially, you'll get a different response, I imagine. But you could go with it is still carbon, both of them. So this pencil lead is just as good as the diamond, I imagine. Uh, so here on the left, uh, we have the arrangement of the carbon atoms there and the diamond shape gives it some very different properties than more here, what we have in a graphite where they're actually arranged in kind of layers uh, and that makes more of a graphite sort of situation. Like I said before, the fluorine is more of a soccer ball sort of arrangement. So let's talk a little bit about ions, which we touched upon a second ago when we were doing those examples. As I mentioned before, ions are uh, guys that do have charges. And uh, as I mentioned, there are two types of ions. There are cations and anions. Cations, as we saw there, are uh, guys that do lose electrons. And typically, it is the metals. And we'll talk about the reasons why that is, as well as to why they typically will lose electrons. It has a lot to do with a lot of what's referred to as their periodic trends. Um, because of those periodic trends, metals tend to not want to hang on to their electrons and they don't really even want to gain electrons. They have all these sort of properties that make them want to take my electrons, please. And that's why we see something like sodium again in a neutral sodium atom. Because its atomic number is 11, it would have 11 protons and it would also have 11 electrons when it's neutral. Sodium is group number one, which means it will always actually make a plus one charge. And in this case, again, that plus one charge means it has lost one electron. So in this case, it would have 11 protons because it is still sodium and that cannot change. Uh, but it would have only 10 electrons, uh, which gives us that plus one 
again, leftover charge. Sometimes we could represent this process happening by writing a, a little chemical equation. And then that's what we see here. Uh, we have our sodium that has no charge. It will then become sodium with a plus one charge and give off one electron. And on the left-hand side of the arrows, we talked about before in chapter 10, I think, those are our reactants and the right-hand side of the arrow are our products. And when we kind of show an element losing electrons, uh, we always write the electrons on the product side to indicate that they're kind of being given off or being lost is how we represent that. And we should always, when we write the formula of an ion, you should always write it with the charge. So if it is something that has a charge, you should always make sure uh, you include the charge when you write the formula for it. Uh, if it, no charge is written, it is assumed that it is neutral. And obviously if you're talking about an ion, you should always write that charge in there. Here's magnesium. Again, magnesium on the periodic tables, 12, uh, which means it has 12 protons. In a neutral, it will have our 12 electrons. Magnesium is actually group two, which means it will uh, lose two electrons and become a plus two charge. So this guy with our two electrons here would still have our 12 protons because it's magnesium. Once again, we'll have two less electrons, which would be 10, and that gives us our plus two charge left over. And here we would see the equation written uh, just like that goes to magnesium with a plus two charge and going to give off on the product side two electrons here uh, on the product side. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. So uh, you'll have some type of information given to you. So if there's really nothing mentioned about a charge or if you have the formula written and you don't see a charge, uh, which is always located usually upper right, uh, you could safely assume that it's neutral. Uh, if you have some problems like we did earlier where you're like asked how many protons, electrons, and neutrons, and it's all in words and they don't mention anything about it having a charge or anything like that, or if it's an ion, uh, you could safely assume that's going to be neutral. Uh, but for example, if we had one like we had earlier where it says like, you know, you know, how many protons, electrons, and neutrons would a sodium ion have? That part of it where it says ion tells you that it does have a charge and then you would have to take it into account. Now, other questions? <clears throat> All right. By the way, when we have ions and we want to name just the ion by itself that's positively charged, uh, the way that we do it, if it is not a transition metal in a sense, uh, we just use the whole name of the element. So for example, uh, this guy here with the Na plus would be referred to as the sodium ion. Uh, Mg2 plus would be referred to as the magnesium ion. And that is how we you name just an ion that's positively charged by itself. That is not a transition metal for the most part. If it is a transition metal, we do actually include uh, the actual charge on those guys. Because as I mentioned before, transition metals can have variable type charges. So if you had something like, uh, clear out some room here. You had something like the iron two that we saw earlier. If we were actually going to name this, we would still use the whole name of the element, which is iron, but we, we would actually use a Roman numeral of two. And that Roman numeral indicates the charge, and we would call it the iron two ion. And that's only for transition metals, and it's because they could have a variable type of charge. So you have to tell somebody, hey, in this case, it's like the iron with the plus two charge versus, say, the iron with the plus three charge. You don't have to do that with something like magnesium because magnesium will never make anything other than a plus two charge. And in a second, we'll take a look at how you know, you know which ones do those type of things. Um, or if you had something like uh, Cu plus, uh, this would be the copper Roman numeral one ion. Yeah, and again, that is what the Roman numeral indicates is the actual charge. So, sort of the uh, non-transition metals, if it becomes a positively charged ion, just the name an ion at the end. Uh, if it is a transition metal, except for three, which we'll talk about, uh, you have to sort of include the Roman numeral with it as well.
Any questions on that? <clears throat> A little preview of naming, I think, uh, coming up. Now, obviously, as we've been talking about, anions are guys with negatively charged ions. And that is a result, <clears throat> excuse me, as we talked about of gaining electrons. And that means that they have more electrons than protons, which is why they have, again, that negative charge. So chlorine, again, if we take a look at the periodic table, there's 17, which means a neutral chlorine atom, uh, which has no charge written, uh, would again have 17 protons. Also, matching number of electrons to give us our no charge. Chlorine typically will make a minus one charge. And again, the negative means that it has gained electrons. And the one means it has gained one electron. So it will again still have 17 protons because it's chlorine. But it will have one extra electron, which gives it the negative one charge. And that again is how we get there. Um, same thing with oxygen, for example. Oxygen is uh, number eight there on the periodic table. And uh, in a neutral oxygen atom, it would have eight protons and again, a matching number of electrons to get zero. Oxygen will make a minus two charge. And this guy will have, again, our eight protons. Minus means a gain, two is how many it gains. So that will give us 10 electrons giving us our minus two overall charge. Now, negatively charged guys are typically nonmetals, are the ones that make a negative charge. And as we'll talk about, they pretty much have all those properties of, unlike metals, I want to keep my electrons. And not only that, I would like to take yours as well. So nonmetals have all these properties that make them on. Uh, we actually dropped the last part of the element name and we replace it with ide when we have to name an ion so chlorine instead of chlorine here this becomes the chloride ion uh, instead of oxygen this guy over here would be the oxide ide ion so sometimes we drop a little bit more than the last part of the name but uh, that's how we get fluorine uh, becomes fluoride bromide nitride was that nitrogen that one that we had before uh, we put the ide on there we do represent it in an equation like we see here uh chlorine plus an electron will make our chloride ion again it is on the reactant side when we are gaining electrons uh, oxygen here will gain two electrons and again, it's on the reactant side. So we could also represent it gaining electrons, like it's being added to whatever's there. And we put the electrons on the left-hand side of the arrow. Again, as we've talked about previously, when we were doing it a while back there, uh, it is only the electrons that make charges for the reasons we talked about that uh, if we change those protons, then we're changing the element. So we cannot touch those guys. Any questions on any of that there? make what charges when we do look at the periodic table and we do look at ions there are certain things on the periodic table that have fixed positive charges no matter what the situation is so everybody in group one will make a plus one charge when they do everybody in group two will make a plus two charge group three will make a plus three charge i'm gonna say for the most part it's gonna be aluminum is pretty much the one that you're gonna come across is the one that's going to happen. Right around here, we have our staircase kind of coming down. Uh, so there's no real good pattern there for four. Uh, but starting at group number five, and what we're talking about is the nonmetals above the staircase. So we're talking about the nonmetals here. Uh, that will be minus three. And minus two, four, six. And minus one, four, seven. So these are guys with fixed charges. Um, there are transition metals here, but transition metals, again, typically will have variable charges. There are three exceptions, though, that have fixed charges. And that is right here, which is zinc and cadmium. If I write that, cadmium. These guys, when they make a charge, will always make a plus two charge. And then if you hang a left there at cadmium and hit silver, silver will always be a plus one charge. 
So this is pretty much everybody in terms of their fixed charges. Everybody else has the ability to make a variable type of charge. As we will talk about our friend hydrogen here could actually go both ways. It could be positive or it could be negative. So hydrogen is one of the only elements that can kind of go both ways. It can go positive or negative. Yeah. They, they are not a part of the groups that we use in here, which is the representative numbering the A groups. Uh, they're one, two, they're between group two and group three. Uh, if you use the other sort of numbering, they do actually have num a group numbers, but we don't use those in chemistry in most cases. Yeah, so when we talk about group three, it is uh, this group three over here. And when we're talking about charge, really, for the most part, it's aluminum. Most people include gallium as well, but it can have a little extra charge as well. Uh, but mostly it's aluminum in that case um, as well. So these are definitely important things to remember, you know, what things make each charge. Uh, help you, uh, obviously, as we continue on through naming and stuff like that. Any questions up there? And when you have ions, by the way, and where you find ions are uh, basically in solution. So basically in solutions, that is where you basically find ions. They're floating around. That's pretty much where you find them sort of active and ready to go. And electrolytes are solutions that when they dissolve in water uh, will conduct electricity. And there's different types of electrolytes. Uh, there's strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, and non-electrolytes. But it's actually the presence of those ions in the solution that helps it conduct electricity. Um, so let's talk about each of those maybe here. There we go. Uh, so for example, a strong electrolyte is something that will 100% break apart into ions, which means you have none of the whole units still together. So if you took something like sodium chloride and dissolved it in water and you had a sodium chloride solution, in that sodium chloride solution, you will have 100% sodium ions and chloride ions floating around. You will have none, none of those guys in that actual solution. So if you made a solution of sodium chloride, all you have floating around are sodium ions, chloride ions, no sodium chloride units still together. Because it produces so much ions in that solution, it helps complete the circuit and all that, and it will conduct electricity really, really well. So this will conduct electricity really well. A very common experiment is you take like a light bulb and you hook some electrodes into it. You dunk it into the solution. Light bulb will turn on very, very brightly. It will conduct electricity really, really well, and the light bulb will turn on really, really bright. So I'll go with a bright light bulb as that example. Now, if you have something that's a weak electrolyte, it will actually mainly stay together, but will produce some ions. Now, because it's able to produce some ions, it is still able to conduct electricity. So it still can conduct electricity. But we'll use the light bulb example in the light bulb. If you did that, it would turn on, but it would look very, very dim, dying almost, but it will turn on a little bit. Now, an example of that, for example, if you took hydrofluoric acid, that is a weak electrolyte. And when you put it in solution, it will break apart into hydrogen ions and fluoride ions. But mainly what you would have in that solution is the HF units still together. You'll have a little of these guys. So if you looked at sort of the test tube or beaker, you would have mainly the HF units in there, but you'll have a little bit of H plus and F minus kind of floating around in that solution. Because it still has some ions, it will still be able to conduct that electricity, but nowhere near the extent of like a strong electrolyte. 
you also will typically see these arrows that head in both directions when you talk about a weak electrolyte. And that means that this reaction is what is referred to as being reversible. And what happens is at some point, you will start to make products, which is going from reactants to products. Left to right is what is referred to as the forward direction. At some point, you'll make enough products that those guys will recombine and head back the other way, which is referred to as going in the reverse direction. So as you go this way, that is the forward direction. And again, as you make some products, it will then head in the opposite way, which is the reverse direction. It will eventually come to what's known as chemical equilibrium. And for you, that is also known as Chem 1B. That's all you talk about in Chem 1B. But eventually, the rate at which it goes back and forth will actually equal chemical equilibrium. difference is happening at that point. The last type of electrolyte, which is really a non-electrolyte, uh, will dissolve. But uh, no ions are produced. So it will not conduct electricity. Not instead of no conduct, <laughs> not conduct electricity. Uh, so something like sugar, for example, right? Sugar uh, will dissolve in water and you'll get sugar that's dissolved. But sugar is made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, which means they're actually covalently bonded together. They share electrons. You don't make any ions when you do that. So it will not conduct electricity. That's also why water... Just so we're clear, the water that comes out of your pipes when you take a shower is not pure water. Yes, they actually put ions in it to clean it and you will electrocute yourself if you try to blow dry your hair in the shower. Yes, so don't do any of those stupid things. Uh, but they actually do put ions in there to kind of clean it. So that's why obviously normal water, right? We have to be careful with electronics because it will conduct electricity because they actually put ions in there to kind of clean it. Yeah. I, I don't recommend any electronical devices in your shower. I'm going to say so. Unless it's made for it. I don't know. They have weird shower things now, right? With music and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to say take caution always when you're dealing with water. So just take caution. Water, dangerous. Be careful. All right. Use at your own risk. Is that enough warnings for anybody listening? All right. All right. So here's the example of that light bulb. This is a uh, non-electrolyte like pure water. Uh, light bulb doesn't go on. Again, there's really no ions in there to help conduct electricity. A little bit of water with some sodium chloride dissolved in there is enough to get our light bulb again to conduct electricity really brightly. A dim uh, or not a weak electrolyte would be it would turn on again, but be very, very dim uh, when you did that. All right. This, by the way, is what an ionic compound looks like when it is not dissolved. All the ions come together. Um, and why is the uh, positive ion smaller than the negative one? How do you become positive? You lose electrons, which means you shrink, right? Your electron field kind of cloud gets smaller. Negative guys gain electrons, which means they gain electrons in their sort of cloud and they become larger. So that's why it comes, right? You throw some water on there, you stir it. Helps it all dissolve when you start stirring it and stuff like that. All right. One last thing here. When we talk about putting these ions together, a positive ion and a negative ion. The overall charge when you write the chemical formula for it should always equal zero. So you always want to have the simplest way to get to zero. Uh, so when we take something like a sodium ion, which is positive one, and a chloride ion, and we put it together, plus one and negative one has no charge. So we write the formula for an ionic compound as sodium chloride. The formula for an ionic compound should never have a charge in it but it is made up of two things that do have charges. It's made up of a cation, which is positively charged, and an anion, which is negatively charged. So if we took our barium here, which is plus two, and our oxygen, which is minus two, again, we just need one of each of those, and that will give us BAO, which is the proper formula for barium oxide. Again, the combination of those two things have no charge. But again, it's made up of two things that are charged. And that always happens when you take a metal and a non-metal together to make an ionic compound. 
Uh, it is always made up of something that has charges, but the overall charge should always equal zero. If things do not have the same charge, like aluminum and sulfide, you want to think about the common number. And the common number can be found very easily by just multiplying those two numbers together. Three times two is six. And that is the simplest way to get it to zero. So all you have to remember is I got one aluminum with plus three, which means to get this guy to six, I need two of them. To get the sulfide here to six, I need three of them. And then you just write how many you put there. So that's one, two, one, two, three. And you get the proper formula. Sometimes people are taught to do the switcheroo. Doesn't work 100% of the time. So if you want it like 93% of the time working, you could just blindly switch the charges, but it will not work most of the time or all the time. So it's a good idea just to kind of think about it like that to balance out the charge. Uh, same thing with our potassium and our phosphide. Again, one, three times one is three. So really I need more of this guy and a grand total of three of them. That gives me a plus three here to balance out my minus three on this side. And I have three potassium. So I write the number on the bottom. I have one phosphorus and that will give me my proper formula. Any question up there?